Can, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We're, you're good to go now. All right, good. Welcome to the Alabama Barrier Island uh, Restoration Assessment Final Report Webinar. I'm Chris Blankenship, uh, the Commissioner of the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Just a little bit of background uh, about me. Uh, I'm a native of Dalton Island. Uh, before becoming the Conservation Commissioner, I worked for the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, Marine Resources Division, that's headquartered on Dalton Island. I've been there since 1994. Uh, we still have a house on Dalton Island, and we visit it quite often. Uh, I've lived or worked most of my adult life on, on the island. The restoration of Dolphin Island is both professionally and personally important to me. I apologize for us not being able to meet in person, but due to the COVID-19 and travel restrictions, this was the best option uh, to provide the information in a timely, timely manner. The format today will include presentations from the U.S. Geological Survey, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and others to provide information about the assessment process and the results. There will not be live Q&A or comments on the webinar. Questions and comments can be submitted online through June 26, 2020, and we'll provide that uh, email address at the end of the presentation. The Alabama Barrier Island Restoration Assessment was a science-based collaborative effort between the state of Alabama, the U.S. Geological Survey, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to investigate viable options for the restoration of Dolphin Island. They can increase island sustainability and restore vital habitats for species affected by the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill. The study was funded through a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation Gulf Environmental Benefit Fund. The study results are intended to inform restoration decisions for Dolphin Island. Uh, the need for the study. Dolphin Island and the remainder of the Barrier Islands from the Mississippi Sound have been historically losing surface area and their capacity to protect mainland natural resources and infrastructure. Natural processes, rising sea level, severe and frequent storms, and engineering activities all threaten the continued sustainability of Dolphin Island. Moreover, the loss of the Barrier Island area threatens the estuarine ecosystems of Mississippi Sound and its resources, including historic oyster reefs, and exposes the mainland coast and marshland to increasing saltwater intrusion and damage from future storms. Many project ideas that would provide varying types of restoration on Dolphin Island and the surrounding area have been submitted through the Alabama Deepwater Horizon portal, a suggestion portal. The cost to implement all the projects suggested would be hundreds of millions of dollars, and this would be more money than would be available from all of the funding sources. This study sought to evaluate restoration actions based on sound principles of physical, ecological, and decision science in order to inform decision makers of the restorative outcome of various project suggestions. To accomplish this goal, a team of scientists and engineers set out not only to document scientific complexity, but also their connection to how the island has changed over time and how it may respond in the future. The team used a conceptual ecological model to document and communicate the complex relationships between the essential components of the Dolphin Island ecosystem. The model helped identify key threats and stressors that have changed the island and the effects those stressors have on island processes, sustainability, and coastal and living marine resources. The model also evaluated key uncertainties like sea level rise and storminess that should be accounted for during project evaluation because of how these uncertainties influence habitat sustainability over time. The study identified opportunities for reducing the effects of island degradation, resulting in the development of stakeholder-informed goals and objectives for the restoration measures that were evaluated. Again, I appreciate you joining us today on the webinar, and now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Nicholas Enright, a geographer from the U.S. Geological Survey Wetland and Aquatic Research Center, to talk about some of the recent changes and present conditions on Dolphin Island. Nicholas? Yeah, thanks, Chris. And as Chris mentioned, Barrier Islands like Dolphin Island are very dynamic makes it important to 
collect updated yield data and understand conditions changes. For this effort, a large team of researchers from many disciplines collected and analyzed yield data. And this, this group included engineers from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Engineer Research and Development Center, or Corps of Verdict, Mobile District, ecologists, ecologists, geographers, and hydrologists from the U.S. Geological Survey, including St. Petersburg Coastal and Marine Science Center, the Wetland and Aquatic Research Center, and the Lower Mississippi Gulf Water Science Center. And these data that were collected in it can be, can be grouped into three main, or I'm sorry, five main data types, including bathymetric and geologic surveys, wave and current measurements, water quality data, sediment distribution information, and habitat data. And collectively, this information was used to, to update baseline conditions, but also to provide a primary source of data uh, for model development and validation. Each drop down in this page covers the data types that I mentioned, but for the sake of time uh, today, I'm just going to highlight the efforts on bathymetric data collection and habitat data collection and distribution. So now I'll, I'll jump into bathymetric data collection. Uh, in 2015, the USGS, and in collaboration with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the State of Alabama, conducted high-resolution single-beam and multi-beam acoustic survey in waters in and around Dolphin Island. You can see on the right hand, you can see the, the range of vessels that was used for this survey, ranging from a jet ski for shallower waters to a larger vessel in the middle for deeper waters. And then in the middle, uh, the bottom uh, map that you're seeing, those black lines indicate that the track lines or survey lines where data were collected. And these data were then used to create a uh, updated uh, bathymetric map that you can see in the middle uh, upper map. And what you can see there from colors from red to blue is water depth. And you can see this, this uh, data provided an updated bathymetric map for Mississippi Sound and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, in addition to providing that, that updated C4 map, uh, these data could be combined with older bathymetric surveys to look at C4 change and also to provide a uh, baseline information that's needed for uh, hydrodynamic models. Uh, one of the things you'll see kind of in each of these drop down tabs is some text that's in italic. And I wanted to point out there that we have maybe just a brief paragraph on the data, uh, but if each of those links will get you to the data where you can access the data, you can read about the metadata, and in some cases you can find reports that really dive into the details and uh, on method, so the results. At this point, I want to uh, shift down to habitat data collection. So just like uh, the bathymetric survey data collection, we did an on-the-ground collection for uh, habitat data. And in the fall of 2015, we visited the island uh, and collected uh, elevation data. You can see there with a the tripod and vegetation data documenting uh, the different species of vegetation that we're seeing and, and also the habitat types. Uh, you can see that map on the pane in the, uh, on the left side shows the, the areas that we sampled. And this included uh, 67 transects that were spread across seven sites uh, throughout Dolphin Island really trying to hit all the different types of habitats that are found on the island. Each transect is, is represented as a dot. And now this data is, is important as standalone information, things on uh, information on elevation and information on vegetation. But really what we were interested in for this data collection was collecting data that could be used to develop a baseline habitat map that we'll look at now. So this uh, baseline habitat map was developed using uh, aerial imagery, one foot aerial imagery from 2015, along with uh, LIDAR data that both were collected for this project. And when you're mapping habitats in a coastal setting, one of the important things to consider is tidal regime. So that graphic on the upper left shows kind of three simple tidal uh, classes. You've got super tidal or upland areas, and these are areas that, that are higher and they're only going to see uh, inundation from tides under extreme events. Whereas the intertidal, that yellow dashed line, these are areas that are going to see uh, tidal influence 
from saline waters, maybe once a day up to maybe once a month. Uh, and there's the subtidal areas that you can see, that ponded area, is going to always be exposed to those tides. It's going to always be flooded from those saline waters. So this type of information it was embedded into the classification scheme. You can see to the right where we had a label on all these photos for the habitat. There was 19 different classes in this habitat scheme. And this habitat scheme was developed specifically for this uh, project. And when we, we developed this team, we, we looked at what was done in, in areas around Dolphin Island for habitat mapping, but also in, in other areas as well. And I'll just kind of quickly talk about uh, the scheme where you've got water marine, intertidal beach, beach kind of on the high energy side of, of the, the island. And on the back side of the island, you've got water entry and intertidal flats, intertidal marsh, more in the low energy setting. Of course, there's dune behind the beach, and that we've broken into three different uh, types of dune based on, on habitat or vegetation cover. And on those back slopes of dunes, we'll have a variety of habitats, including meadow, where there's uh, uh, herbaceous vegetation, barrier flat, which would be kind of it is maybe an overwash band, uh, forested, scrub shrub, forested wetland, and water fresh. And each of these classes, you can see based on the color of the label uh, and these photos, are linked up to a tidal regime. Some of the things that aren't shown in these photos that are also mapped were the developed shoreline protection, oyster reef, uh, which came from uh, Alabama uh, ADCNR data, and uh, seagrass, which came from uh, Mobile Bay Estuary Program data. And one of the things that we want to point out, too, on this map is, is this uh, story map that we're showing does have some dynamic maps. You can see the legend on the right, and you can interact with this map by zooming in, panning around to an area of interest. So at, uh, at this point, I want to move from present conditions and cover uh, future possible conditions. So here, uh, forecasting barrier island evolution provides decision makers the ability to assess the resiliency of coastal environments, the future climate change scenarios, along with the efficacy of various restoration measures. For this project, a suite of computer models were developed for Dolphin Island, including morphological, and when we say that, what we mean is elevation and dependentry or water depth. Katrina cut structural response, water quality, habitat modeling, habitat suitability for oyster and seagrass. And collectively, these models involved complex calculations on a range of model extents, also known as, uh, also called domains, model domains. But what you're seeing is, is in that top box, the green box, uh, these, these model domains range from northern Gulf of Mexico, so this is really the big picture, what's happening at that uh, northern Gulf of Mexico level down to the regional level, what's happening around uh, Alabama and in the Alabama coastal area, down to what we were, we were really interested in this project, which is what's happening at the local level, that pink box at the bottom, what's happening at Dolphin Island. Just like the uh, present conditions and the data collection, this modeling component involved uh, 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 Ecologists and geographers from the U.S. Geological Survey, St. Petersburg, Petersburg Coastal and Marine Science Center, and the Wetland and Aquatic Research Center. So I want to take a closer look at the morphological modeling. And again, this is looking at elevations and water depths. And for this, uh, the, the team developed computer models to describe how the island would evolve over a 10-year period for 12 possible future conditions of the island based on potential changes in sea level and storminess. And when we say storminess, what we mean there is, is the frequency and intensity of storms. So you can see these 12 scenarios here, and what we're looking at is actually, it's a map that shows elevation and the imagery, and you can see those 12 different scenarios uh, lined out. And as you move down uh, the rows, you're going to see an increase in storminess from the top, uh, top row being a low uh, storminess, and then to the bottom row being an extreme storminess. And as you move across that group of 12 uh, through columns, you're going to see an increase in 
sea level, and this ranges from 0 0.3 meters on the left to 1.0 meter, uh, one meter on the on the right. And so what we're looking at is how that the evolution of that island uh, could happen under these potential uh, scenarios. And how this happens in terms of the model is that the model accounts for the effects of regular tides and waves on sediment transport, storm-driven beach and dune erosion, along with post-storm beach recovery. Now, if you look at these 12 scenarios, uh, we, we, uh, we use these to see the range of, of, of potential island configurations. Um, and you can see when you're looking at them closely, you'll see a lot of overlap. So for a few reasons, we decided as a team to zero in on the two that are in the red boxes. One of the reasons was just feasibility. Uh, we can't look at restoration alternatives for all of these 12 scenarios. And another, as I just mentioned, was there's a lot of similarities when you start looking at the different scenarios. So what we ended up moving forward with was a, a box on the left uh, that's highlighted in red. What that is, is the medium storminess low sea level change, so that's that 0.3 meter sea level rise change. And then on the bottom, uh, on the dynamic map on the right, is the high storm unit, high sea level change. And again, that's that 1.0 meter sea level change. And one of the things when we're looking at just how does this change, how do these uh, uh, future scenarios impact morphology, is what we're seeing is that on the medium storm unit, low sea level change, the one on the top, the island does experience some shoreline erosion or some dune erosion. Um, and on the bottom box, the higher high storm and its high sea level, the island actually breaches in two locations. Uh, you can see on the either side of Katrina Cut and that dynamic map. Another thing that, that uh, is, is, uh, you, you can see is you can see some breaching along Little Dolphin Island and Pelican Island. So just like the uh, present conditions uh, drop downs, each one of these modeling uh, drop downs has a link to an extensive report uh, for more information on the methods and the results. At this point, I want to jump to the next one, which is the Katrina cut structure. So, the Katrina cut structure is a, a rubble structure you can see in the middle. It's, it's a rock structure, and this uh, is, is located kind of in the central portion of the island. And one of the questions that the team had was, what you know, how, can we estimate how uh, damage to this structure over those 12 different island configurations related to storminess and sea level rise? And what you can see, just kind of the key take home, is that when, uh, on the right, you can see the blue is going to be lower damage, cumulative damage, and the yellow colors are going to be uh, kind of grading to yellow is going to be higher damage. So what you're seeing is across those 12 scenarios, areas that have a beach in front of that structure is, is going to result in, in less damage across both of those uh, storminess and sea level rise uh, conditions. And we'll move on to, to I'm going to skip water quality modeling, but I will address it uh, for habitat suitability index uh, discussion. So we'll jump to habitat modeling. So uh, this habitat modeling when you see this come up, you're going to see it looks a lot like the habitat mapping. And that was the idea, was, was can we predict uh, habitat distribution and coverage uh, under future conditions um, so we can see uh, maybe how uh, restoration actions or even future conditions related to storm and sea override may impact habitat on the island. And this was done by, by uh, using the, the initial habitat map, the baseline habitat map, and combining that with landscape position information to understand how things like distance from shoreline and elevation can uh, influence the distribution of habitats. And when we knew that, we then could use the, geomorpho uh, the morphological model outputs to uh, produce habitat predictions, as you can see here. Now, one of the things you may notice is that it's just comparing the two, the, the baseline map with these results, is that we did have to simplify some of the classes, uh, and this, this is kind of common when you move from a mapping state where you can use imagery and all that to get to all these class detail classes compared to just modeling with elevation and landscape position alone. And what these include is, is meadow and barrier flat, as you remember I mentioned, those became a single class called barrier flat. 
Similarly, uh, weedy vegetation uh, encapsulates both scrub shrub and forested. And then dune is just one single class. One of the things uh, you'll also see is developed is, is found in these dynamic maps and the model output. But I want to stress in a case that we didn't uh, model, explicitly model developed area change. We made the assumption that the developed areas would remain constant. There was really two reasons for that. One was it, it, it could be assumed that over time developed areas could become protected at any given time for future conditions. So that was something we really, uh, is a high uncertainty of when that would happen. So that was one reason. And another reason is when you start looking at predicting development and development changes, that's really an entirely different modeling process than the one we use for this work. Uh, so we, along those lines, we just left that as, as uh, assuming that it would remain constant. Another thing to point out about this uh, these habitat modeling is it kind of brings in a new wrinkle when we get to the habitat modeling phase. And that is, as we talked about the sea level change of 0.3 and 1.0 meters, but how fast that change occurs is important for marsh. And that's because intertidal marsh can keep pace to a degree with sea level rise. Uh, so if the sea level rise happens quickly, it, it, it may uh, not allow for marsh to keep pace. Whereas if it's gradual, maybe the marsh can keep pace through accretion. Uh, and this accretion occurs through sediment and biophysical feedback. So to kind of get at that concept, what we did was we, we assumed kind of two different speeds at which that sea level rise would happen, the sea level change would happen. And what you can see on the left is the intermediate sea level curve. So this is a more gradual increase of sea level through time. And, and as a result, we see that the marsh is generally going to track sea level change. Um, you're not going to see as much in areas that were present-day marsh transition to intertidal flat or even open water. Whereas on the right side of this, this uh, uh, screen, you're going to see the high sea level curve. And this is a really a more, much more rapid sea level uh, increase. And as a result, you're going to see uh, intertidal marsh, as we, we know it today, you know, may not be able to keep pace. There's going to be limited accretion. So you're going to see some loss or transition from marsh to intertidal flat to open water. Just like I, I talked about in the morphological model results, I want to highlight one of the big changes that we see. And, and again, it's related to uh, the high storming and high sea level rise. It's one of the things that we see, you can see there at the bottom, is a lot of habitat that is super tidal or upland will transition uh, from, based on these model results into intertidal habitat. Um, and at this point, I want to switch to the final uh, model uh, discussion, which is habitat suitability. So I, I mentioned in the beginning, we, we looked at habitat suitability index models for oyster and seagrass. And uh, as you can see here with these maps, it's a, once again, it's a spatially explicit habitat suitability model uh, developed for those two habitat types. And these models were developed uh, based on literature, what parameters, uh, are important for these for uh, these particular uh, groups, oyster and seagrass. Um, and but moving beyond literature, we also calibrated our model uh, using uh, field data, uh, monitoring data for oysters and seagrass, along with continuous water quality data um, in the area. And what you can see here is we're making uh, can now make predictions uh, using the water quality data that I mentioned, the water quality modeling uh, outputs and the morphological modeling outputs associated with this project. Uh, so one of the things that you're going to see is this, uh, the top panel uh, is going to be that uh, uh, medium storminess, low sea level rise, and then the bottom chain is that high sea level rise, high storminess. And what you remember is that there was breaching on either side of Katrina Cut, and especially in the oyster, you can see how that darker green kind of shifted down and plumes to a, a, a lighter shade of green. And what's happening there is that those breaches are, are from the from the water quality model outputs, we were able to see that the result of those breaches was an increase in, in uh, salinity and the Mississippi Sound. So what we're seeing from these model results is, is that based on water quality conditions alone, uh, that breaching led to a, a, a decrease 
from highly suitable to suitable for parts of the Mississippi Sound for oyster. And we also see that for seagrass, but it's to a much lesser extent. And at this point, I want to pass it on to the next speaker, who is Elizabeth Godsey, a coastal engineer from the U.S. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers Mobile District. Thank you. 
on a two-year cycle based on the stimulated transfer rate of approximately 178,000 cubic yards per year. Overall, we found the sediment transport processes on the Antilla Shoal to be multi-decadal in time scale and heavily influenced by highly intense energetic storm events and will be influenced in the future by rising sea. System-wide benefits were largely directed at the critical habitat and managed lands along Pelican Island, as well as the indirect benefits along roughly 1.5 miles of the east end of Dolphin Island. Construction costs for these measures range from 72 to 103 million, with 50-year O&M ranging from 8 million to over 29 million. Ranges and prices were driven by various potential sand sources considered, which consisted of areas within the Mobile F Tidal Shoal System, relic standpoint deposits located just offshore of Petty Boy Pass, and upland sources located within existing dredge material placement sites along the Alabama Tongue River system. So the Gulf and Beach measures. So these measures we formulated for both the east and west ends of Salvo Island, where we, were, where we were primarily intending to create and restore beach and dune habitat while reducing possible damages to existing habitat landward of the island. That means things such as herbaceous and woody dunes, freshwater ponds, and maritime forests. The measures were also evaluated to determine if they would reduce the risk of island breaching in the future under the storminess and sea level change in the scenario simulated. And all five measures were evaluated in this group. These included the extension and incorporation of dunes along the Coastal Impact Assistance Program East End Shoreline Restoration Project, with the placement of up to 1.2 million cubic yards of sand along the shoreline and a frontal dune that stretched along 4,800 4, feet of coast to slightly overlap with eastward to where the naturally extensive piping system currently is. The west is east and end and beach and dune restoration project includes a measure that was proposed in the deep water horizon restoration portal. And it's in the, the, the town of Dolphin Island's 2011 Dolphin Island Beach and Barrier Island Restoration Project report. Specifically, this measure would restore beach along approximately four miles of the west end developed stretch of coast with the construction of a frontal dune seaward of the existing structures. Two additional west end beach and dune restoration measures that looked at restoring island width and dune alignment to conditions near those that were present in the 1950s along the western developed segment of the island, as well as expand beach fill in front and west of the tree to tie in with the natural dune system to the west. These additional measures also incorporated voluntary buyout or removal of approximately 225 structures on the west end that would allow for the natural setback of the dunes away from the receding shoreline and placement in regions observed in aerial photography from the 1950s and 1970s. And all of the beach and dune measures provided benefits of risk reduction to have associated with storms and rising seas to over Beaches over beaches, dunes, Ferry Island Flat, and Intertidal Marsh as compared to that no action case. With long term benefits of damage acreage ranging from 40 acres for the East End project to over 280 acres of elected trans beach and dunes. For all measures, breaching was stimulated under the higher storminess and sea level rise, with the exception of that West End Trina Cut Beach and Dunes project. Also evaluated was the removal of the East End Katrina Cut structure and the excavation of approximately 230 tons of rock. This measure would restore roughly 27 acres of back barrier flat, intertidal flat, and intertidal beach. While this measure does not eliminate the risk of breaching, the simulated breaching under the higher storminess and sea level change were in natural undeveloped areas of the island and in the region of the current structure. While breaching occurs, it is a natural process for which several studies have suggested 
play an important role in maintaining carrier iron width. The initial construction costs for these measures range from 7.7 million for the extreme cut structure removal to 28 to 30 million for the east end beach and dunes, and 62 to over 120 million for the west end beach and dunes, with an increase to 90 million of 90 million for measures that considered voluntary buyout. The 50-year O&M ranges from 24 to 33 million for the east end project. And 149 for the smaller west end, and upwards of 439 million, depending on the far area sources, for the larger west end Katrina Cup project. For the back barrier and marsh restoration measures, these measures were formulated to sustain and enhance the important ecosystems and diverse habitats supported by the area. These measures were also evaluated as to their buffering of more inland habitats during higher frequency, less intense coastal storm events. The back bay measures that were evaluated included restoration of tidal marsh to restore the back barrier and flatten on the north side of the island. The Aloe Bay, Gravelly Bay, and the Katrina Cut Marsh incorporated potential beneficial use of dredge material to achieve suitable elevation for tidal flats and native marsh vegetation over acres that range from 6 to over 25 in size. In addition, the Aloe Bay measure incorporated approximately 2,000 feet of breakwater from seaward to reduce wave energy, and the Graveline Bay added an OEM or an operation and maintenance component with a spray application of sediment over the restored and existing marshes to ensure a consistent source for the marsh system to keep pace with rising seas. The only measure that does not include a marsh component in the back bay is the 2010 borrow debt restoration, which evaluated the effectiveness of restoring the back barrier flat areas that were excavated during the deep water horizon oil spill. And all of these measures restore that barrier and marsh habitat to the existing lead side shorelines and associated habitat. The initial for these measures were 4.1 million, depending on the bar area source considered, with an additional 50 year OM of 30.9 million for the Graveline Bay project. For the land acquisition measures, Total of 11 acquisitions, land acquisitions from the Deepwater Horizon Restoration Florida were evaluated. These measures span on the island from east to west, ranging from four acres to over 700, and would provide benefits with, the, with a variety of habitats, including beach and dune shrub flats and tidal pools that provide primary constituent elements for winter and spiking clover, maritime forests providing habitat for resident and migratory birds and near shore bottom lands that provide essential habitat for the production and survival of fish and shellfish. While these measures were not explicitly evaluated in the integrated modeling system, they were incorporated into the decision tool and evaluated relative to the conservation utility values. Construction costs for these measures range from 100000 to over $10 million, with a 50-year O&M ranging from 100000 around 250,000. For the next two tabs, I'll show output from the morphologic, which is the island elevation and near shore water depth changes, as well as the habitat for a subset of conditions and measures to give you a feel of the types of results and model data generated during that study. For the morphologic modeling, change modeling, seven different restoration measures were modeled under a subset of storm and sea level change scenarios to evaluate how they would influence the island evolution over a decade period. The first condition represents a moderate storminess period characterized by island overwatch and dune recovery with an approximate 57% likelihood of occurrence combined with the historic rate of sea level change. That has been observed on Dawson Island with a rise of up to 0.3 meters estimated 
the car was only 50 years. The second condition represents a more intense storminess condition characterized by repeated eyes overwash and rollover with an approximate 29% of likelihood of occurrence combined with a few safe high sea level change or rise of up to one meter estimated to occur over 50 years. The island's changes capture the Zenith model were then integrated into the habitat and the Katrina covered fox modeling to determine those effects on habitat evolution and water quality as it relates to moisture, reef, and submerged aquatic vegetation, vegetation and the benefits that a measure may provide to those elements. The dynamic maps on the right highlight a few measures and help visualize the changes in island structure predictions between the future without measure as shown in the bottom left, the west end beach and dune nourishment measures in the upper left, and the back bay measures displayed in the upper right at a 10 year at the 10 year simulation time period for the median storming and system storage sea level change in the By clicking on the West End Beach and Dune project in the project footprint list, the map will zoom in the general footprint location of that restoration measure and the general boundary of the restora restoration measure flickers as that transparent light white feature. As you zoom in, you can compare the influence of the beach and dune in the upper left as well as the back bay measures in the upper right on the island elevations along the tree cut and the regions of the BP oil spill borrow pit on the north side of the island. For the habitat change modeling, it has a similar look and feel. The habitat predictions and habitat suitability index models were applied to six restoration measures. As with the previous results, we highlighted changes between the future without action measure in the bottom left and the west end and dune nourishment measure in the in the upper right or upper left and the back barrier marsh restoration in the upper right at the 10 year simulation time period under that medium storminess and historic sea level change. Again, by clicking on the west end beach and dune footprint list. We'll zoom in to that general location of restoration measure. And as you zoom in further, you can compare the influence of the beach and dune in the upper left compared to that no action in the lower left. And you can see the, the habitat on the back bay measures in the upper right along Katrina Cut and the regions of the BP oil spill on the north side. Uh, in addition, the bar graph in the left pane shows the percent change for the 10 year decadal simulation for the scenario being highlighted in the dynamic pane to the right. We see that the west end and east end beach and dune measure are poor, increased in supertidal habitats like barrier islands, island flats, and dunes by 8 and 15 respectively, whereas the marsh restoration measure R5, as we would expect, led to an increase in intertidal marsh of over 19%. The habitat suitability index results were not highlighted in this story map. However, the main finding was that restoration measures that limited or prevented breaching, which were your less inpatient unit measures, tended to reduce the negative impacts on oyster and seagrass habitat suitability compared to the future without action measure for the high storminess, high sea level change scenario. Much of these model outputs were integrated into the decision tool that Elise Irwin, a research fishery biologist with the USGS, will discuss next. Thank you, Elizabeth. I wanted to start by saying that it is recognized that coastal restoration decisions belong to a class of problems that are extremely difficult to solve and have been termed wicked, requiring transparent decision processes for decomposing problems toward identification of solutions. Without accounting for multiple, often competing objectives that include social, fiscal, and 
conservation value, restoration decisions may not achieve desired outcomes. Structured decision making, or SDM, is a framework that has been employed in the field of restoration ecology to deliberately break down complex problems. SDM processes define the problem and stakeholder values, identify potential alternatives for restoration, model the consequences of the alternatives on the objectives, and evaluate trade offs among the potential decisions. This objective centered approach to decision making explicitly incorporates the human dimension and their values, helping to assess trade offs among restoration measures. Bayesian Belief Network, or BBN, are probability-based decision tools that can be used to evaluate how restoration measures influence multiple stakeholder abuse. The simplified influence diagram to the right uh, represents the objectives or values for each decision context, whether that's the restoration and land acquisition measures or um, and so these diagrams identify the objectives that Elizabeth outlined earlier that were relevant to include in the decision tool and the model. So for restoration objectives, for restoration measures, the objectives were to maximize island sustainability and coastal natural resources and island biodiversity, and also maximize social acceptance and minimize cost. Similarly, land acquisition measures were evaluated relative to objectives related to maximizing the acres acquired, the juxtaposition of the parcel, like for example, where there's a gate on the gate floor, while minimizing habitat scarcity at the future development risk and cost. The multiple technical components that predicted changes in habitat and habitat suitability, island topography symmetry, considered how restoration conditions would perform over 10 years in the face of uncertain storm and sea level futures. Incorporating the storm and sea level rise scenario in the decision tool allows stakeholders to evaluate risks associated with implementation of restoration measures. Next, I will present the decision tool that we used during the pro project to try and go back to the restoration measures. <laughs> Practice the Bayesian Belief Network, or, or BBN, that models the complex causal relations, which are represented by the black arrows. So you model the relations among the island's ecological, sustainable, social, and fiscal state variables, which are represented by the yellow rectangle. And so it, it considered how those restoration measures would stack up against the different uh, state variables or, or objectives. Notice that the objectives from the influence diagram are aligned with groups of state variables in the network. The left side of the, of the network, which is delineated by the green box, encompasses marine and coastal resources and biodiversity associated with complex habitat on the island and its surrounding estuarine and marine water. The species included in the network are surrogate species that have high affinity for certain habitat types. They each represent a species of other important habitat species on the island. Habitat affinities were developed for all of those species by model experts and from public accounts of the species of habitat needs. We have a table that shows a full list of the species we consider. In addition, information regarding the expert elicitation analyses can be found not in the report. And if you can click on that table at the bottom of that, that would be Also included on the left side of the network were the habitat suitability indices that Nicholas discussed earlier for seagrasses and oysters. And also we included a suite of ecosystem services that are provided by multiple habitats on and surrounding the island. The middle section, highlighted by the blue box of the network, illustrated many variables that were considered to be socially important, such as island reaching and impact to infrastructure. And those uh, same variables were characterized using data from the, the technical models that Elizabeth talked about. The right side, yellow um, box incorporated the initial and maintenance costs associated with each restoration measure. The blue rectangle below the cost lists the restoration measures that were assessed during the project. The red rectangle incorporated the storminess and sea level rise 
receives a risk of trade-offs among measures. The nature node below the storm and sea level rise node incorporated the modeling scenarios where the projects have allowed for assessing changes in the states of the variables over the 10-year model horizon. The green hexagon is where utility nodes get combined values for different potential outcomes associated with restoration measures. The state for each node in the network were characterized with data from the technical model developed for the project or with expert knowledge. In the figure, the states are listed in each nature node. For example, for each species, their population could either increase, decrease, or remain static depending on how their habitats were influenced by restoration measures and storm and sea level rise scenarios. The likelihood or probability that each state would occur are represented by the black bars in the nodes. The network software compiled the network and calculated the expected value of each restoration measure by summing the values of the five probability weighted utility nodes. These values were populated in the blue decision nodes. I don't expect you to read these off the graphics. I will discuss them in a little more detail in a few minutes. The highest expected value among the restoration measures considered to be the best decision given the objectives in the network. Utilities were equally weighted such that each objective was valued the same for decisions. Note that these models can be interactively used in the future to assess the consequences of restoration measures to individual states in the software. Next, I'm going to talk about the land acquisition measures. Um, Notice that we didn't do the technical models associated with these. These parcels were identified by stakeholders and, and were evaluated in the project interim report as potentially important to acquire for conservation purposes on Dolphin Island. So a second network was perhaps tried to evaluate the parcels relative to conservation value and cost to help decide which parcels to purchase. The parcels are listed in the, um, in the blue decision nodes. And similar to the network for restoration measures, the decision tool calculated the expected value of each parcel by summing the values of the probability weighted utility nodes, the green hexagon in, in this figure. The purchase cost utility was calculated based on the range of prices for the property and range from lowest to highest. The land conservation utility was comprised of four state variables. The acres were acquired, the just position influence, or was the parcel next to conservation land, the habitat scarcity, for example, was the parcel comprised of a critical habitat that might be scarce on the island, and the future development, development risk, was the parcel likely to be developed or not. These states were applied and the utility for the combined states were calculated in their value centers into the utility node for the conservation value. When the network was compiled, the parcel was the highest value was quantitatively the best one to purchase based on the objectives defined in the network. So now I'm going to summarize uh, what all this means. The, um, as indicated above, the decision network calculated the expected value for each decision, whether it was a restoration measure or land acquisition. The final utility scores are presented in this table, along with the cost associated with each measure or partial purchase. For each type of restoration scenario, the projects are ranked by their utility value. Of the proposed structural measures, the East End Beach and Dune restoration had the highest utility of 301.1. Um, for many other measures, utility values were nearly equal. The range of values for the next 10 ranked measures were nearly were only 10 points apart in, in their range. The top Rent as title show measure was the Pelican Island Southeast Nourishment. And the best set right back barrier and marsh restoration measure was a tie between the marsh habitat behind the Katrina Cut and the Aloe Bay Beneficial Use Restoration. For property acquisition, the Grand Clean Bay property ranked the highest of the non structural measures. Utility values were more variable for land acquisition decisions, ranging from 8.7 to 142. The full methodology results um, of this part of this decision analysis can be accessed through this link at the bottom of this tab. Now, the restoration measures that have the highest utility in this network were those that best satisfy complex, multiple stakeholder objectives associated with social, 
fiscal and conservation values on Dawson Island. The highest ranked restoration measure, he sent each in June, was the one that minimized impact to freshwater wetlands, open freshwater, and woody habitat on the east end of Dawson Island, especially in the highest sea level rise. The measure also has low initial maintenance costs as well as including a multiple benefit societies, such as low impact on infrastructure, gain from critical habitat for wintering types, flutters, and other conservation zone lands. In terms of the marine natural resources, coastal natural resources, and sustainability facilities, this measure increased the probability that the population response for most species would be positive. For many Thank you and good afternoon. 